This boy is being sent on a mission to enter enemy lines, but the catch is the enemy are all girls. He's stuck in a world where men live in one nation, while the women live on the other half of the continent. Currently, the girls actually rule the world and are stronger, where they call themselves foxes, while the guys call themselves the wolves. Regardless, this boy's mission is to resupply one of the strongest special teams of the wolves, rumored to have a winning record against the foxes. It's then revealed that if the foxes catches any strong men, then they'll be punished with a rice cake smashing to extract seeds before being finished off. Out of 100, maybe only two get to experience the special treatment, but the rest just gets annihilated. Upon making it to the halfway point, the group encounter a town with no men on guard, so they begin to be on high alert, scared that the foxes might be nearby. The squadron then take a closer look, only to realize that most of the boys are already knocked unconscious. So the leader spurs into action as he motions two squads to search the area while one squad looks for anyone still somehow conscious. Our boy then checks multiple people knocked out, where he discovers that everyone is still breathing, confirming the rumors that the foxes do not harm regular men or weak men. Nonetheless, his buddy got no brains, but at least he's super brave, so he starts running into rooms, yelling for the girls to come out. Eventually, they find a special member of a top unit, so they attempt to help him to see if they can do anything. But as they check on the guy, light begins to pour out of a mysterious room after a body suddenly gets thrown out of the window. Simultaneously, the guy they were trying to help looks up, murmuring to them to get the heck out, as these boys have no chance against the enemy. He then smirks, revealing to them that they're still here, the legendary Crimson Foxes. We then learn that the boy's name is Herring, and unfortunately for him, his bonehead friend wants to see a girl for the first time. Being a virgin will do this to someone, so he rushes on, hoping to be strong enough to get captured, just so he can experience the rice cake smashing himself. Herring then tries to use logic to reason with him to no avail, as his friend never got to experience the stage like clarity after exploding. With no other choice, Herring follows his friend, probably because he wants to experience the rice cake as well, not wanting to be deprived of the opportunity. Upon heading outside the building, they get shocked as they witness everyone, including the leader, is on the ground, unconscious without them even getting to hear any commotion. Suddenly, a girl with insane speed comes out of nowhere, trying to ambush the two as we discover her to be a crimson fox. In literally one second, he gets clapped and knocked out, but at least he got to look at what a girl looks like. Unfortunately, the one girl he got to look at isn't even a pretty one since she looks like somebody from the Twilight movies. While knocked out in the dream dimension, Herring begins to recall a moment he had with his father. He then recalls the memory with his father where he warns him that if he ever encounters the legendary Crimson Foxes, he must do one thing. The one thing. He must use a special move to turn his face into a sussy baker capable of lowering the attack of the foxes. Now remember the special move he gains consciousness, but he finds himself confused, wondering why a bag is over his head. A girl then whispers to him, telling him that he's finally awake, so she also removes the bag from his head. He then looks up to see the girl, but he can only see the outlines of her as she orders him to cooperate or the girls outside will punish him harshly. Upon closer look, she gets smitten by his attractiveness, so she takes a moment to take it all in. But our boy didn't forget his one special move, so he activates it without hesitation. Somehow, it seems to actually work as the girl's heart begins to pound just like my heart when I eat anything fatty. Herring then gets startled, as he hears someone making weird sounds to his right, so he investigates. Upon taking a closer look, his world gets shattered, as his bonehead friend is currently on a scenic bike ride with a crimson girl. He always hoped that the rice cake attacks were not just rumors, so right in front of his eyes, one of his dreams are proven true. His friend then looks lifeless, as one of the crimson foxes attempts to extract every siege he can from the banana plantation. Afterwards, he looks away flustered, but like a true Sigma male, he stares straight at the girl in front of him. But she only stares back, busy thinking to herself what to do, as her partner in crime on the other hand is busy going ham, as if she's sucking the soul out of him. Eventually, she finally says something, so she mentions how they don't really have much time, thus, she must get on with it. She then reveals to him that she knows it's obviously both of their first time, but since she's stronger, she takes the lead and puts on the pants in the relationship. As if he's a banana, she rips off the banana peel and continues to urge him to stay calm the entire time, warning him that he might get hurt if he doesn't. Upon ripping off the banana peel, the girl thinks to herself that the rumors are true, the wolves actually don't wear any undies exactly like what a true savage would do. She then wonders why the banana plantation isn't grown yet, since his friend had a fully grown plantation before they even got to do anything. So to make it fair, she does the same banana peeling to herself, just to help the plantation get started as they are running out of time. And just like that, as he gets to see a real rice cake and more, the banana plantation begins to react as if it's a spaceship ready to blast off into space. A flashback then occurred, 
back to the times of Herring's grandpa. There, he told the story of a boy who got captured by the Crimson Foxes within one month of joining the supply group, but they found him two days after, with his life sucked out, making him never the same. It then turns out that after they extract the seeds, they turn back into their childlike forms, stuck there, forever. Back to the present, with the girl showcasing everything she has, Herring calls her twin dragons beautiful, even though he knows his life is basically over with his plantation turning into a rocket. She then gets shocked, as if her eyes were deceiving her, totally not expecting a behemoth to appear. Meanwhile, off in the distance, a mysterious man shrouded in black appears with a sword, looking like he's a grown-up Kirito. He then looks on from afar, ready to complete his mission by himself, while Herring gets ready to start clapping. However, he notices a white flash not too far from him, and only one person in the world could be that fast, and that is Aria herself, the strongest female warrior. Now with his eyes on the prize, he gets ready to attack, as he only wants one thing out of this entire ordeal. Back at the town, another crimson fox begins to count up all their successful rice cake extractions, where she makes fun of the boys, claiming that they aren't the same anymore, since they keep lasting shorter every time. Miss Alita Battle Angel then turns around asking to see if the two new guys are any better than the rest. But the blonde girl gives the unsurprising bad news that they are all still the same. Alita then wants to leave since she's bored, but the blonde says to give the two girls inside more time, since it'll be hard to track them down, even if it's the elite Karim squad chasing them down. The girls then talk about Aria, where they reveal that she's the current reincarnation of the girl that took down the leader of all men centuries ago. Anyways, back to the action, Herring learns from the girl that her name is Danby, where she whispers to him to never forget her name. After telling her name, she proceeds to straddle the bike so she can finally start her mission of extraction. But apparently the banana tree could not fit inside the garden since it was too grown to handle. So she decides to water the tree real quick, since there's no way it's going in without any help. As such, she starts to water his banana plantation, quickly irrigating the tree's surroundings to make sure it's slippery wet. Apparently, this was such a rare and forbidden maneuver that Herring has never ever heard of the special honey tiak slurping. Meanwhile, his bonehead friend literally passes out after the girl is able to extract his soul, so she gets mad that he can't continue. So she abruptly stops and slaps him awake, where he starts to gasp for air. She then looks at him in disgust, asking if he's really already done, since this is the only time in their lives that both will ever get to experience the rice cake and hot dog combining. But he doesn't answer, as his pride is already depleted, so she begins yelling at him, unable to believe she waited 20 years, just for everything to last just a few seconds. She then threatens him that she will punish him, if his tree doesn't grow back ASAP, so she tells him that she'll give him one more chance if he can come back to his senses. But then she gets distracted, as she notices Herring's tree getting irrigated with a mouth extension calling Danby a sly little dog. But Danby doesn't care, as she just wants to complete the mission, so Herring just sits there, busy thinking about whether this is all worth it in exchange for his life. Since Herring's friend is fully fried and exhausted, Danby's superior comes over to watch, busy wanting a turn at the behemoth, but Danby shoes her off. However, she smiles and roots for her, telling her that he won't disturb her, so she decides to leave. Right before she gets to the exit, she reminds Danby that if she can't handle it, then she can take his place as she can easily take over for her. Danby then turns to Herring, grabbing his face, telling him to focus super hard. How about just get on with it? Danby continues on by telling Herring that this is the most important moment in her life. But she doesn't realize that it is also the same for Herring. She then finally goes for it, and so hearts begin to appear in the surrounding area as the rocket blasts off into her space. She's instantly mesmerized as if something got awakened in her, so she musters up all her strength to keep attacking such a massive behemoth. Unlike his friend, he's able to actually continue further than 10 seconds, proving to everyone that he can actually handle the Crimson Fox. Everyone then starts to watch surprised, unsure how Herring is able to dominate, even though he looks like such a weak boy. Meanwhile, the mysterious man fast approaches the hideout as he swiftly cuts through the air. A few moments later, he makes it to the hideout, but the girls notice right in time. So they quickly head to their defensive positions to meet the intruder head-on. But it turns out the mysterious man is actually Levi from Attack on Titan taking a break as he slices through the air like nothing. Without any hesitation, he slashes forward, taking on multiple crimson foxes by himself. Levi then jumps into the air, easily avoiding every attack as his mission is to deal with someone else. He then changes his gaze towards Aria, off at the edge of a cliff. The story continues with Aria unfazed at the sight of Karim, since she's the strongest female warrior on the planet. But Karim only wants one thing, and it's her, the legendary reincarnation of the battle goddess. Meanwhile, a love explosion occurs as the girls buy time for the two crimson foxes to finish extracting some seeds. 
But Danby has started to hit her limit, as Herring is able to withstand every rice cake attack that Danby is able to throw at him. Eventually, she transcends the realm of mere mortals as a crimson fox for the first time in a very long time is able to reach the climax of the mountain during a bike ride. Danby then mutters to him to wait, but Herring is confused, since he's the one not moving, so he keeps his eyes closed as if he's scared of ghosts. But then it dawned on him why she stopped, it turns out that she's unable to deliver any more rice cake attacks as she needs time to recover from completion. However, since he's new at this, he tells her that he hasn't reached the climax of the mountain, as he thinks playtime is now over. Suddenly, a peeping Levi appears, looking mad as heck, probably wishing that Mikasa was here so she can witness him being a weirdo again. Nevertheless, he whips out his sword in front of him. A second after, the window blows open, much to Herring's dismay as the poor boy still hasn't experienced the stage like clarity after blowing the truckload. So Karim walks in unopposed, but he just stares at Herring and the boneheaded friend, standing there, as if he's the step bro ready to do some laundry. But then Naria comes to save the day, flying in like Mikasa on mobility gear, so she attempts to slice him down. However, Karim easily parries without even having to look behind him, showcasing his true masterful swordsmanship. So the two started to dance around while fighting, but the two crimson foxes trying to extract the seeds are unable to continue riding their bikes. But Aria has a big brain, so to buy some time for the crimson foxes, she starts insulting Karim. She continues by calling him a weeb, where she also tells him to stop being a simp for her, since he's not strong enough. But Karim is just that one friend who never gives up, no matter how many times he gets rejected, since he's a chad with no care at all. So he wicks out his sword again, pointing at her collar, ordering her to give it to him, since he wants only her, since no one else comes close to her power. Now to be clear, if the fox gives you their collar, it means you become the chosen one to destroy their rice cake anytime you want, so they confuse to make strong children. As Arya distracts Karim, Alita Battle Angel attempts to grab Danby by putting her cloak on, as they attempt to escape. But Danby refuses to leave as she's captivated by Herring's behemoth banana plantation, so she tries to hold on by grabbing on a Herring. Luckily for the Crimson Foxes, the blondes are able to swiftly leave, but so did the art style every couple frames. With time running out, Alita has no choice but to literally force her out of the banana plantation, so Danby begins to cry, looking a little like Red Riding Hood. Tears then began to stream down her face as she reveals to everyone that she didn't even get to extract the legendary seeds from the behemoth. As Danby gets taken away, Arya gets Gub's Max surprised as it's been a long time a random wolf was able to survive a rice cake siege. Even Karim's face starts to look like mine when someone steals my ace on purpose as he too cannot fathom a supply member was able to withstand a crimson fox. It's then an introvert's nightmare as the entire gazes of the room shifts towards him. But Herring has no clue on what to do since he's still chained to the chair. So Aria looks at him intently, maybe she's about to jump on him for a bike ride right in front of Karim to test the waters. But instead, the greatest warrior walks up to Herring, where she reveals her name is actually Ara, the current reincarnation of the goddess Aria. Meanwhile, Karim doesn't move as he stares at Ara, instead watching her every move perplexed. With the turntables turning, she removed her own collar and placed it on Herring, proclaiming to the entire world that Herring is her chosen banana plantation. As such, Levi looks like he's about to call upon the powers of the founding titan, since he's about to call the rumbling as her girl picks someone else. Karim then turns to Ara, unable to shout as his rage started to exude outside his body. With a faceless expression, she looks back at him, as if she's trying her hardest to stop herself from giggling, since she's secretly a troll. But before Karim is able to do anything, she escapes away, but she flashes a cake that Karim will never ever get to experience now. Fast forward to the next morning, where we find Herring back at his place, unable to really get out of bed, as he has severe soreness from everything that has happened to him. He also reveals that he got interrogated by the elite special forces last night, where they couldn't believe that he didn't explode. Nevertheless, he keeps daydreaming about the Crimson Fox Danby, as he cannot forget the special experience the two shared together. But he tries to forget about her, as he knows he will never see her again, but at least he got to experience her rice cakes. Suddenly, his bedroom door swings wide open, as his dad barges in, looking like he's ready to beat him back to his senses. Instead, he proudly smiles, telling Herring that it's time to wake up since it's supper time already. Herring then discovers from his father that the entire country is in panic, due to what happened between him and Ara yesterday. A mysterious man then appeared inside their house as they tried to go to the kitchen, claiming that things won't simmer down anytime soon. The man then alerts them, telling them that he's here without any official authorization from the top brass, but he somehow knows everyone's name. Herring's father instantly recognizes him though, so he offers him some supper if he would like. But he declines, so he introduces himself to Herring, revealing that his name is Moo, like the cow, 
and is part of the kingdom's Shadow Ops group. Mu then tells Herring that today will be his last day as private of his support crew, since the Shadow Ops will take care of him from now on. Mu also urges him to quickly adapt, claiming that every agency in the world will be keeping a close eye on him for receiving a Ra's collar. Herring then cries, knowing he can't play Roblox anymore as he'll be too busy getting trained behind the scenes. In the end, Mu reminds him that he has no choice, so Mu will be expecting him at sundown. Later on in the day, he gets a surprise punch to the face while he was just busy minding his own business. It turns out to be his friends and crew from the squad as they want to know more from what happened the night before, super eager to know more details about rice cake smashing. As they pester him to spill the beans, the entire squad began to round up as Herring is about to tell the story of the first-hand account of rice cake sieges. Herring starts off by calling them all rookies, insulting them by claiming that they will never experience or imagine what he went through, as they are too weak. Regardless, he began telling the story, and as he continues, more people joined in the circle, intently listening as if he's the teacher of forbidden powers. The boys then started to get scared as they only heard rumors beforehand, never an actual first-hand experience. But then they got flustered as Herring moved to excruciating details of sweet honey tiak slurping and much more. Eventually, he motioned how the banana plantation instantly transformed into a rocket when Danby was helping him out. So at the end, everyone passed out from the story as they couldn't handle the sounds he was making when Herring was busy reenacting the swishing and slurping sounds. It took a whole night to finish the story, so everyone went to bed. Before Herring is able to go to sleep, he has one-on-one -on -one time with his dad as Herring is getting ready to grab some milk from the store to never come back again. But before he leaves, his dad imparts some secret special knowledge, like how first-class warriors are given a license for rice cake destroying anytime they want. But then his dad became a sussy backup, asking Herring if he was a loser, wanting to know more about his first encounter in extreme detail. His dad then gets surprised when Herring reveals the detail of how he knows Danby's name, as foxes are never allowed to reveal their identity, as the wolves can track them down. So he gets up, ordering Herring to never reveal that detail to anyone else. But he begins to giggle, as if he's remembering someone from the past. His dad then reminds him of what he always says, claiming that Herring is destined to be king, but Herring has never believed his father. The next morning, Herring looks back, feeling at peace with himself, as he leaves everything behind, unable to really choose his destiny. As he lays down during the journey, he finally thought to himself how his father could know every single top-secret intelligence, even though he's just a normal man in a small town. He shrugs it off, though, as he reveals that he really hasn't asked his father about what he did before Herring was born, so it never really came to mind. Regardless, he arrives in front of the gates of the special headquarters, so he takes a deep breath before stepping forward. Someone then yells his name, telling him that he's 21 minutes early, but I can't tell if the person is a girl or a dude. What do you guys think? I'm going to assume he's a guy, since he's part of the men-only nation. No matter, the boy's name is revealed to be Magi, so Magi takes him on a tour around the headquarters. They then take a moment to stop at a nearby training facility, so Magi opens the doors to the mysterious building. Upon entering, all he could hear are people grunting, but he gets confused even more when someone yells out to use their hips better. With his eyes finally adjusting to the room, he finally realized they were practicing specific positions for every member, the unfake foxes. Now I have seen a lot of things, but man, this was such a weird scene, and it looks like Herring agrees with me as well. Magi then interrupts the leader in charge of the exam, asking if anyone is worth looking into, but he just lets him know everyone is still just bang average. Meanwhile, as Magi introduces Herring to the leader in charge, Herring notices that they are all practicing on dolls that his father made. Magi then reveals that Herring is the one that Ara chose, causing everyone in the room to stop everything they were doing, to just glare at him. But Herring is not scared at the display of the entire group, probably because he knows he landed some nice vanilla cake to eat over and over. Afterwards, Magi brings him over to the most important area of the headquarters, as the one in charge wants to meet him personally. As he calls him over, Herring meets the fat old man in charge of everyone making sure their banana plantations grow well to meet the standards of the foxes. He then gets up, asking why the hell would Ara pick him. The story continues with Mr. Baldi reluctantly taking a closer look at Herring, frustrated that the goddess reincarnation picks such a weakling. Rumpy Baldi is then forced to reveal a secret that only the special forces of the female only and men only nation know. Herring discovers that there's a mini city called Prushil, where the chosen ones congregate to do rice cake smashing. It's the most luxurious place on the planet as only the top warriors from both nations are ever allowed in, even if they are constantly at war. At Prushil, anything they want is given to them, as the sole purpose of the place is to make sure the boys destroy the rice cake, while the girls extract the seeds. The old man continues by explaining that if a man and woman ever steps foot into a room, 
they aren't allowed to leave until a day has passed. But to get in, he needs the golden ticket, which just happens to be a collar from a fox. As such, he whips out the collar of the strongest warrior on the planet, the one that Ira has given to the weak herring. Upon hearing the clarification, our boy instantly gets his banana plantation excited, as he starts to lose focus by day dreaming about the legendary goddess reincarnation. Herring then zones out, finding himself a little bit scared since as of a few days ago he's never seen a girl, and now he's tasked to conquer the strongest. The man in charge then leaves the room, reminding him that he has one month to prepare, and that he needs to notify Ara of the date. He then reveals to Herring that there is one catch, and that is he needs to actually be accepted into the elite squad before he can notify her. Luckily, Herring is motivated as he wants Ara really bad since she probably has the best vanilla cake, due always destroying every man on the battlefield. As the old man leaves the room, he yells that maybe there is hope for Herring, as Herring discovers that everyone somehow knows his father, a man that goes by the name of Mukbum. Meanwhile, at the Crimson Fox territory of Borderlands City, two very notable members of the Crimson Foxes are busy drinking Slurpees from each other. The Blondie finds herself loving the taste of the rainbow, since for her, the same flavors happens to get stale eventually. On the other end is Martina, where we discover that the two have been trying to fuse themselves, so they become an Oreo cookie. Anyways, as the two cosplay some scissors, Tana asks the blondie about the news of Ara, wanting to know more about the man that she has finally chosen to eat the cake. So the blondie lets her know that it wasn't even a man, it was a puppy of a random supply group and not part of the special forces for the wolves. As such, the entire planet was thrown into chaos as the number one warrior did not pick the second strongest, which happens to be Karim, the mega simp that always gets denied. Nevertheless, the blue-haired goddess finds herself wandering around the Fox Special Headquarters, but she notices some commotion at the end of the hallway. She overhears Alita Battle Angel worriedly talking about Dambi, as she's apparently been skipping every meal and refusing to drink anything. The girls think it's a form of love sickness as she never got to extract the seeds from Herring's behemoth when he got captured. Unfortunately for her, if she keeps up the antics, she'll get punished by the Queen of the Foxes, even though she got it bad enough as someone else you want man. As we meet more of the Crimson Foxes, every single one starts to think that Era might be onto something as Herring might be more powerful than he seems. But, as girls do, they leave to join an episode of Gossip Girls, as the girls pester Alita about information on the so-called behemoth. So she reenacted what happened when Herring's banana plantation transformed into a rocket, which Danby tried to explode it over and over. Even Alita was feeling flustered just from her telling the story, even though she was busy fighting off Levi most of the time. Nevertheless, the trio came to a conclusion as to why Ara chose a puppy, claiming that she chose Herring just because of his tree trunk size. Alita then made a good point as she points out what Herring's thingy did to Danby, something they haven't really seen in a long, long time. Afterwards, the girls find the squad leader, so they try to gank her, asking where the hell she's been, but understandably, she's been interrogated all night. Suddenly, everyone's attention shifts towards the room of the blondie earlier where we discover her name to be Biol, as they hear some really weird and loud noises coming from the room. So the girls try to sneak in as their curiosities get the better of them, wanting to know more about what's causing Biol to be really loud. Much to their astonishment or disgust, you decide they realize what she's been up to. So they keep watching on exactly like you sussy Becca's watching our recaps. However, during the ordeal, Biol becomes a Chad, as she wicks out a herring banana plantation lifelike replica, as the two talk about the rumors of herring owning a size of a prince, Anyways, just like every single video, the girls are glued to the scene, not realizing that they are secretly loving every single moment. As such, more and more decide to crowd the door as they stared on perplexed, wondering if they should close the browser when their family walks in. But then the door burst open due to too many foxes watching the amazing show they have never seen before, so make sure to subscribe. Regardless, the girls ask if the rumors are true, wondering if Herring actually has a weapon of mass destruction hidden inside his banana plantation. Although it's top secret information, Bile decides to let it rip, just like my farts, leaking to everyone that his size is indeed of a prince. At that very moment, every crimson fox became mesmerized without even seeing it themselves, so they began charging towards the replica, wanting more. Meanwhile, Herring feels a sudden chill on his spine, as his ultra instinct is probably kicking in, somehow knowing that dozens of girls are clamoring for him without them even seeing his face. The next day at the Wolves' headquarters, every single official becomes shocked as they inspect Herring for his otherworldly features in front of everyone. Everyone is in utter disbelief, even the old grumpy Baldy is left speechless, as they witness Herring's banana plantation with their very own eyes. Eventually, the top officials agree that our boy literally is a prince, due to the behemoth of sword that he is carrying. 
Now imagine being herring right now, since I'm surprised he's able to get the banana tree growing in front of only dudes. Nonetheless, it's revealed that herring's ultimate ability places him rank 1 middle class. With the insane revelation, every single leader almost chokes on their own spit, unable to fathom how a puppy is basically a hidden titan. So with the onset of the new information, every single squad commanders began to try and recruit him. In mere seconds, everyone in the ultra-top secret room began fighting one another, as they all want Herring to join their elite team. But just like with the random drops in quality, Herring is left unamused as he didn't expect anything to unfold exactly like this. But Moo Man smartly interjects, reminding every commander in the room that it's a Ra, the legendary 1000 steps, that has targeted Herring for her vanilla cake to get destroyed. So everyone began to simmer down as they all got brought back to their senses, remembering how intricate the situation is with Ara involved. As such, Mr. Baldi stands up, claiming that although it is quite surprising, the Council still needs to cover one of the most important information. That is, to be specific, his basic power level. With his unknown power level, the entire Council erupts as every single one volunteered to observe the following power level test, wanting to know more about this prince. As the day continued to drag on and on for Herring, he finally had time for a small break. However, it just coincided with Sussy Becca Levi appearing at the compound, still looked mad as hell. So he finds Herring and turns his back on him, where he murmurs to Herring how much he wished he could destroy his life right now. But instead, he points his sword at him, telling him that he'll get eaten by red foxes anyways, so he asks if he's ever swung a sword before. Karim then continues by ordering Herring to go ahead, and show him what he's truly capable of doing. So like a true Sigma male, he decides to use the fake training sword, causing Kareem to be instantly frustrated. As Kareem is unable to control his anger, the top brass looks on from afar, laughing at how a random boy could make the legendary warrior lose his cool. Even members of the top Garibi force began to look on, claiming how they have never seen their captain get so heated up before, especially in front of such a weakling. So the elite Garimbi team started to chuckle, wondering if Karim might actually slice and dash the boy in front of everyone. But Karim just stands there, face palming as even the old man is getting excited at seeing Karim get all up in his emotions as the simp is still unable to believe he lost a Ra to the weak pup. So Moo, like a true gentleman, whips out some caramel popcorn for everyone, as the show is about to go on. Fast forward to the Black Castle, where the Wolves King resides in isolation from the continent. The current king of all men is named Buxib Baram, where he sits on his throne, with captured foxes as mercy. He fiercely orders the fox under him, to make sure she doesn't waste any of the honey that the king is giving her, since bro is a menace to society. Nonetheless, he can't get enough from the foxes he has captured, so he glistens at the thought of Ra's vanilla cake, since it's the bomb as every man wants it. Anyways, bro is revealed to be like a villain from Vinland Saga as he literally has dozens of captured foxes that he claps with his hand every day. After attacking every single rice cake in front of him daily, he finds a new one hiding in a corner, asking the fox what she's afraid of. So he reaches out to her with his hand, and the rest was history for her, as it is now her daily routine. He then sieges the rice cake with no holding back as if they are just a sleeve to him. After the king leaves the room of destruction, a random man asks what level of satisfaction would he rate his experience today. But the king is agitated at the question, as every experiment brought to him to elevate his experience has always been bang average, with no noteworthy standouts. So the king asks the man if he could bring better products, but he reveals to the king that he can't as they need to capture top-class products. As such, the king orders the man to hurry up and get him a working top-class elixir to enhance his rice cake experience, as he wants to test it out on a raw. We then discover that the king is secretly attempting to mass-produce potions that will entice every fox to want their rice cake destroyed, regardless of any collar or procedure. Meanwhile, back at the special headquarters, every man is glued to duel between Herring and Karim. Either Mr. Baldi spits out his popcorn, as everyone witnesses Herring almost slice Karim with a plastic training sword. Even more so now, Karim is absolutely full of rage as he almost gets embarrassed in front of his leaders and his own elite squad. As such, Karim finally takes him seriously, so activates his battle stance as he swipes away Herring into the distance. Shortly after, he swiftly counterattacks without warning, disappearing with blistering speed as if he was just lightning. Surprisingly, Herring is actually able to block the attack last second, surprising Karim himself, as not a lot of people on the planet can react that quick. With the show off to an insane pilot episode, everyone began cheering as they watched Karim not hold back a single inch. So Levi continued his relentless attacks, where he is able to get in position for his final blow to finish off Herring. But somehow, Herring is able to dodge with absolute pinpoint accuracy, confirming to everyone that he is indeed the real deal. Meanwhile, 
Mu started collecting his winnings as he knew what Herring was capable of, so the old man turns to Mu, telling him how he can't believe Wook Bum has been hiding his son the entire time. Mu retorts that he totally expected Bum to raise his son the proper way, but EQ can't believe Herring has surpassed his own expectations. With Herring still standing, Mu claims he needs to forcefully stop the power level dual test as Karim might want to actually end him. So before Karim has a chance to do so, Mu steps in, proclaiming that the test is now over. Simultaneously, he mentions how the world has been so boring lately, subtly telling him not to accidentally destroy the new mushroom and fun guy that can change the world. Afterwards, Mu pipes up, notifying Herring that his rank is now erased as the Shadow Corps, now acknowledge his powers for passing the special tests. With full synchronization mode activated, the entire council agreed at the same time, welcoming him into the Garimbi Elite Squad. From now on, he's part of the special forces, but Herring still has no idea why everyone seemingly knows his father. The story continues with Herring realizing that the wolf's strongest swordsman has left him alone. On his first ever mission with the Elite Squad, he finds himself lost in enemy territory, while rain pours down heavily. So Herring stands still, unable to figure out a solution as most of his gift went straight to his third leg instead of his brain. But then, out of the ordinary, a fire fox comes out to greet him wearing my favorite color of all time. Luckily for Herring, she doesn't instantly destroy him as the plus-size warrior beckons him to come over instead, seemingly looking like she's actually friendly. It's then revealed that Herring's reputation exceeds him, as all the women now know about his special gift, so it turns out his behemoth serves him better than unlimited knowledge. So like a weak boy he is, he just says nice to meet you, probably awestruck, since you never find someone her size in anime. A flashback then occurs, back to exactly two hours ago, where the Garimbi squad heads back to headquarters. On a ride there, Herring gets introduced to the rest of the squad, where we meet Suri Maru the nerd then Bao Eden, a guy that looks like he loves pork buns then Ho Wom the hipster with two earrings and of course, captain of the Garimbi, the legendary Karim. It turns out there's also a sixth member, but he's currently on a secret mission, so the mystery man will be revealed later. However, while busy minding his own business, Maru the nerd suddenly attempts to kick him in the face, but Herring dodges, as if he's Neo from the Matrix. Maru then starts giggling like a little girl, happy that Herring is able to dodge his surprise attack as it proves to him he isn't some random smuck. So he continues his attack, this time trying to cosplay one me man instead, but Herring uses the help of Pork Bun's head to swiftly dodge. Eventually, Herring gets enough so he counterattacks, quickly able to land a hit on Maru's face, causing his glasses to fly off into the sunset. The hit serves him right as our nerd is probably jealous that Herring has a better banana plantation than he does. Regardless, both Wong and Eden are amused at what just unfolded, so they try their hardest to widen their eyes open. Unfortunately, Herring made a fatal mistake as he accidentally dodges out of the caravan, and the squad didn't stop to pick him up. But Levi helps him out by throwing a training sword and a scroll to help his journey back home. Maru the bottom fragger also looks on, yelling at him saying that if he survives his journey back home, they'll throw him in a massive welcome party. Back in the present, Herring introduces his real name to the Fire Fox, somewhat perturbed that a random girl is calling him Prince Banana Tree. But the fox doesn't care as she's too busy thinking to herself how lucky she must be to run into the Legend 27 himself. She then sheathes her sword, telling the anxious Herring to relax, as she isn't going to call for backup from the Fire Fox Squad. But then the sussy nation attacked, as the Fire Fox can only look on, as if Herring is some kind of ice cream cake, as she doesn't want to share it with anyone. She then introduces herself as Hyangri Yangji, part of the squad called Pebbles from the Red Foxes. And just like Danby, she tells him to make sure to remember her name, as if Rice Cake Mission is about to ensue. Nonetheless, Herring stays in combat position, as Yangji is busy wondering why the prince has such a loose form, equipped with only a measly fake sword. So she thinks to herself that he must be bait, as he's alone with no backup, yet she doesn't care if there's a trap card about to be activated. She claims that she would even give up playing Roblox just to experience the gift that Herring has as she's ready for his mythical fruit. And so she charges forward, but even I would be scared, as the ground beneath her starts to shake from her every step. But Herring stands firm, ready to slash down the first boss he's encountered, waiting for the perfect time to counter. With just a blink of the eye, the battle is over, as Herring is able to deflect her attack, so he proceeded to trip her to the ground. She then crashes like the titanic hitting an iceberg, and all you can hear is Mayday Mayday, target down. Youngji is left shocked as she finds a sword right beside her, basically forcing her to yield. Herring then appears in front of her, smiling as he claims that he won, giving her the advice that she only lost because she let her guard down. Herring then makes his best facial impression of the overly attached girlfriend as he nicely asks for her collar. 
Although Byeonggi is initially stunned at his request, she gives in after Herring continually orders her to give him her collar. As such, a red fox finally admits defeat, so the Garimbi elite squad once again keeps their winning record. Upon receiving her collar, Herring retorts to himself that this is his second, including the one with the goddess, but it could have been his third if Danby gave hers. Nevertheless, we discover that Herring is actually into plus-size warriors, so he demands for the ritual to occur, right here, right now. So as with tradition, they prepare for rice cake destroying as Herring's motto is, if they move, they're good. But luckily for Yeonji, Herring is a gentleman, so he wicks out his cloak as a makeshift blanket, so that there will be no grass stains for either of them. As Yeonji uses an invisibility potion, Herring's eyes start to cosplay Gollum, as he looks at his precious from afar. Eventually, he attacks and perseveres, where we discover that Yeonji is actually short as heck, so it's actually kind of funny. As the rice cake ritual continues on, Yeonju wonders how Herring could be so skilled, and why does it seem like Herring is full of honey? Anyways, long story short, Herring unveils the behemoth, sending Yeonji into another dimension, just like he did with Danby from weeks earlier. Meanwhile, the rest of her squad searches for her, and it's a very peculiar experience for Yeonji to just disappear without notice. As if Herring is now some kind of god, their faces light up when they start talking about Prince Banana Tree, helping relieve them of the misery searching in the rain. It then dawned on one of the girls that there is one future, out of 14,605 at Yeonji is keeping Herring all to herself right now. But then, a mystery man is revealed, stalking the other two members on top of the trees. Back at the rice cake area, Herring makes Yeonji promise to take care of his future children properly, so she begins to cry, unable to believe a black wolf could be so nice. With the encounter now finished, he waddles out into the forest as Yeonji watches on, claiming how he was a gentleman to the end. She then falls to her knees with no one around hugging her sword tightly as she reminisces about the battle, causing her to be unable to really move. Regardless, as Herring continues his trek towards home base, female archers begin to shadow his every move. One of the girls end up mentioning how they can't believe Yeonji lost to such a weakling, so she aims her arrow right at his legs. She claims that if he can't move, then he'll be able to drink the mythical Prince Slurpee without him perishing. But before she could fire the arrow at the defenseless herring, the mysterious man from earlier appears from behind, ordering her to not make a single sound. He then whispers to her to quietly follow him or else she will find a surprise third leg out of nowhere. Upon catching a glimpse of his face, she realizes that it's Garimbi's legendary Hook Sharong, the second strongest after Levi the Simp. Fast forward to a few hours later, as the darkness begins to envelope the night sky, Herring starts to wonder if he'll actually make it home today. It's then revealed that he actually made it, still fully intact, much to the surprise of everyone in the squad. Upon arriving, people are already quick to make fun of him, due to how he apparently looks like a very unmanly boy. But to his surprise, Maru interferes, telling everyone to chill out, revealing to them how he went head-to-head -head with Karim. As such, even the Street Fighter lookalikes were unable to fathom how someone who looks like Herring could do such a thing. Nevertheless, Maru guides him away from the noobs, bringing him straight to the commander of the Garimbi elite. The commander is surprised to see the new member with limbs still attached, as most don't survive the journey to the headquarters. He then notes how quick he was able to find his way home, so he dismisses him after welcoming him, urging him to get some rest. Stamaru leads him to his brand new room, while simultaneously letting him know that he can drop his guard as he's one of them now. Once arriving at his new room, Herring discovers that he gets to room with the hipster, but that should be okay, right guys? Wong instantly orders him to wash up as he doesn't want to smell any stinky armpits. However, without Herring noticing, Maru looks like he's sending a sneaky signal to Wong, so Herring heads off to take a shower. Wong then volunteers to help him heat up the bath, so he chills by the furnace, chopping wood like a chad with one finger. But he smirks at the end, as if him and Maru have something planned for the night. Inside the bath-like area, Herring washes off, enjoying how hot the water is. Unfortunately, his solo peacetime gets invaded by the man making fun of him earlier, busy talking about how hot the room is. When Herring isn't looking, he Ferrari peeks the corner, finally understand what they meant about the prince behemoth that he was given as a gift. But then, the man looks on in horror, almost as if he wants to scream, as he watches the banana plantation expand like a speedy rocket. Now to clarify, the rocket turned its boosters on, not because of the dude, but because he started thinking about what happened earlier. With the man now witnessing what true prince behemoth is like, he hurries to the other corner of the room, as Herring unknowingly shampoos his hair. The story continues the next morning during sunrise. The commander holds Yeonji's collar, unable to believe that Herring was able to achieve such a mighty feat. With disbelief sewn on his face, he repeats himself again out loud, claiming how high angry Yeonji is the type to accidentally trip, causing an entire earthquake, with magnitude 69 to occur. 
So he asks the second strongest swordsman, Black Serene, to confirm his achievement, which he does. As such, the commander instantly asks if he was able to shoot his banana seed, to which Herring embarrassingly verifies. So the elite members are astonished a scrawny boy like Herring was able to conquer the beast that is Yongji, since she's basically an ox reincarnated into a woman's body. Meanwhile, the commander shoves his fist into the air congratulating Herring as he reveals that no man has been able to come out of that ordeal without a single scratch. It also turns out that Yumji is actually a raider captain, just like Karim or Ra, so she's pretty well known by the elite squads. She's so strong that when she makes a single sound, every animal in the forest starts to run, and she also detests the wolves with all her heart. So our boy is lucky as it seems like the kingdom of girls are going crazy at the thought of the prince behemoth as every single one will risk their life for the mythical banana. And so, with the addition of Herring, the commander warns the squad that the Black Wolves will probably be giving them another procurement mission. Although super wary at the thought of their mission's difficulty being elevated more, the commander tells them they have no choice, as it's an imperial order. As such, the trio give Herring a death stare, probably jealous he's a prince behemoth, while they're busy being world average. After the briefing, the commander takes Karim to the side, urging him to take good care of the youngest one. Now imagine being forced to mentor someone that stole your girl, no wonder his facial expressions always looks like Levi from Attack on Titan. Meanwhile, Wong slaps Herring's shoulder, telling him to not get so nervous. Since the hipster claims that no matter what happens, as long as he's around, his roommate will always be there for him. Although he feels very suspect. However, as the squad leaves the briefing room, Herring counters, telling the rest he's not nervous, unlike the rest of them. The next morning, the ground find themselves beyond the defenses of the Nation of Men. Four of them sit perched on top of a mountain, overlooking a valley as they pester Herring, wondering what he thinks as it's his first real field mission. But Herring looks on in absolute awe, as if he's closed beta testing the real world, since he's always busy playing Roblox Frontlines, claiming it's better than COD. They say he's crazy, but the nerd closes in, arguing that COD is better, claiming that if he looks on, the graphics is so much better. Anyways, they call them anew, making fun of how Herring is taking in the view, unable to truly believe the world he's living in. However, his dreamlike state gets shattered, as he hears Eden talk about how this soul is going to be taken today. Bro's face then shrivels into what looks like something you can't describe on YouTube, so he yells how he hates Eden, calling him a teenage mutant ninja turtle. Nevertheless, they continue on their mission, where Herring discovers that they are searching for some kind of flower and that they call the Blue Columbine. Wong then goes on a rant about how an ordinary citizen with no powers would never know what it looks like, but Herring is like, who asked? Anyways, Wong whips out a medieval contraption to scale down the mountain, since they got no rocket boosters. After brute forcing the item straight to the ground with one fell swoop, a squad instantly jumps down with no hesitation, as Wong's strength level is 99. Suddenly, Karim comes out of nowhere, and instead of taking the rope down the mountain, he just jumps off so Herring could only look on. Simultaneously, the Black Serang ganks Herring, pushing him off the mid lane so he could drop down to bot lane, since he's had enough of diddle daddling. Now that's one way to get the mission going as Herring is sent flying off, causing him to scream the entire time as a rope tangles around his waist. Meanwhile, at the Nation of Women, the girls from the elite squads within the headquarters begin to gather round. A voice then yells at them, ordering them to go quickly and to put on all their armor. Mira then barges in the strategy room, clearly wearing basically no armor, but she yells at Ara, claiming that the wolves have started to make their move. Ara is caught by surprise with the onset of the news, so she stops drinking milk as she doesn't want to have an accident in her pants during battle, since she's lactose. She then looks on, humming yum as the strongest swordsman can't wait to destroy everyone, although she has some chocolate toast crunch left on her face. But then Ra channels her inner me as she refuses to move, since she's busy digesting food, so Mira has to drag her over to the strategy room. Afterwards, we discover Yumji with no armor on being interrogated by the top brass as news began to spread like wildfire. One of the top brass is revealed to be Heyong Seol He, part of the Black Thorn, who repeatedly grills her questions, refusing to believe that a wolf would be so kind. But the rest of the Black Thorn members begin to get flustered, including Yumji as she confirms everything they are asking. Prince Behemoth has now achieved Ultra Sigma Male status, as the Black Thorn discover he made Yumji explode three times, something that has never happened. As such, even more, every girl wants a piece of Prince Behemoth, wanting to trade lives just for the heavenly experience. Unfortunately, our fiery Yumji has her flames extinguished, as Sully strips her of command, ending the investigation right there. He then orders her to join the med team as they are now ready to care for her, since making sure the banana seed sprouts is now her ultimate mission in life. From fearsome earthquake destroyer to now just a merely citizen, 
forced to wait nine months to continue action. Back outside the girls' special forces headquarters, everyone begins to vacate as they are all ordered to return to main headquarters. But Miss Alita Battle Angel and the special Blondie find themselves still on foot, as their captain is still not ready to leave. While the rest of the girls of the Crimson Foxes congregate, Ara is still nowhere to be found. It's revealed that Ara is actually on the toilet, so she's literally me as she sits there for over half an hour, probably scrolling Reddit the entire time. But Mira gets enough of her antics, so she probably yelled at her, accidentally making Ara finish her daily ritual before battle. As the two head out, Ara catches a glimpse of Yamji with no armor or weapons on, accompanied by a black thorn. But finally, the captain springs into action as she shoves Mira away, fiercely walking straight at Yamji. She then grabs Yamji's face, and instead of destroying her for going after her man, she just stares at her. Nonetheless, as she cosplays Komi, she whispers, asking Yeonji how the experience was in relation to finally extracting a seed. Yeonji replies by saying it was great having a rocket lock onto her, as she didn't know it was possible to experience such an otherworldly thing. In the end, Ara walks out ready to rumble, while also telling Yeonji to take good care of herself as she's proud of her. Unfortunately, before she's able to step out of the room, the commander of the special forces grabs her hair, reprimanding her for being so late. So she turns to Mira with a year screwed face, ordering her to make sure that the Garimbi squad gets totally tormented into defeat. She then finally lets go of Ara, ordering the strongest woman on the planet to make sure she gets as much information from Prince Behemoth as she can. After letting go of her hair, she blames the entire attack on Ara, threatening her that if Herring is found not worthy of her power, then she'll destroy him herself. Seoli also reminds her that she has one month to prepare for her duel at Puzel, so she needs to make sure she's actually made up her mind. Yamju then interferes, telling Ara to make sure she doesn't underestimate Herring, but I know for a fact she'll be staring at something soon. She needs to hurry to her man as every fish in the ocean hurriedly Naruto runs to make sure they get to Prince Behemoth first. As of now, every elite squad from the Nation of Girls has been dispatched, all to stop the Garimbi, but mostly because they want a piece of the prince. You can then hear hundreds of girls begin to laugh simultaneously, as they all chant Prince Behemoth, claiming they won't allow him to rest or breathe if they get their hands on him. Meanwhile, Herring looks into the sky, wondering why he's hearing the sounds of birds laughing over and over, but he shrugs it off, not realizing what's on the horizon. Fast forward to the Imperial Palace of the Kingdom of Girls, some old geezers talk about their declining birth rates. We then finally meet the current Queen of the Girls Only Nation as she stands there, listening to her cabinet discuss ongoing problems. Her name is Hume Garam, wearing an Avhire fit for the Queen of the Red Foxes. Her Majesty then excuses herself out the room, claiming she has urgent business to attend to. Upon leaving the room, the cabinet turns to the Royal Captain of the Guards, asking about Prince Behemoth himself. Regardless, Edo Naren deflects the questions about Prince Behemoth as she instead debriefs them about how the wolves have been utterly obsessed with collecting blue columbines. Although they have been putting their all in their investigation, she still has no idea why they won the flower, but she knows it does not bode well for the kingdom. So for now, she's focusing on the preparations for the upcoming Go Mage. It's then revealed that the Go Mage is named after the gods, where it's an event to help control the population of both nations. Basically, long story short, every couple years a truce is signed, just so every girl and man on the planet can experience rice cake destroying a specific place for an entire day. Even the queen is looking forward to it, as she's busy thinking about Prince Behemoth herself. Nevertheless, the queen motions for her black thorn guards to leave the room, as she's busy preparing to do some sussy becca things. She then changes into a robe, frustrated at the thought of a Ra wanting to claim her throne. So she decides to relieve some of her stress, and to do so, she enters a gigantic bath, greeted by what seems like captured wolves, calling the queen her majesty. After sitting down, she motions for one of the captured boys to come near her. And so her face disappears, signaling to us that we are entering Sussy Street, as we discover this is her first ever time as the cherry tree blossoms. The story continues with the queen of the girl-only nation finally wanting to experience what the hype is all about. So with two captured wolves summoned before her, she tasks them to give her the utmost royal experience or else face dire punishment. Meanwhile, the elite Crimson Foxes continue their ongoing mission to retrieve Prince Behemoth, but Mira starts to learn some secrets. It's revealed that Ara, the strongest swordsman on the planet, wants to install the Prince Behemoth as the rightful king of the wolves. Our Komi lookalike also adds on that she plans to become queen, as she's preparing to challenge the queen for the throne. Now guys, don't complain about the art suddenly pulling a black clover often, since this is basically like those old anime. The only difference? Rice cakes. Anyways, back at the palace, two wolves are still busy entertaining the queen, and if at any point they accidentally explode the tree, then it's game over. 
Garam then sits there, starting to really figure out why the girls love the rice cake extraction missions. So she decides to level up a wolf, allowing a lowly rank to enter the premises of the queen, as if he's cosplaying a battering ram entering the gates of the kingdom. And enter he goes, finally letting Garam's cherry tree blossom to fully mature, as it's the first time the queen gets to witness and experience such a thing. But then, one of the boys looks like he's in trouble, as he knows his life is in danger if he fails to hold his banana plantation seeds from exploding. And within just a few seconds, his worst fears have come to fruition, as he was not able to fully control the banana tree. After a brief sage-like encounter, he knew he was screwed, so he began begging for mercy before the queen. She then opened her mouth, muttering to the Black Thorn guards to remove the scoundrel as he only had one simple job. In an instant, the Black Thorn appeared behind him, quickly closing the gap to dispose of the dirty wolf. Unfortunately, he better learn to fly soon as the queen orders for the wolf boy to be thrown off the cliff. Afterwards, the queen diverted her attention back to the other wolf, but somehow, this guy is still able to be exactly like the rock, when in reality, he should be more like mashed potato. Regardless, she threatens him to make sure to do a good job or else face the same consequence of his old friend. And so he continues with his life on the line, trying to channel his utmost inner farmer, to make sure his banana tree plantation does not accidentally leak. In the end, the queen actually stops being a savage, as she lets the wolf actually rest, and even lets him explode like lava cake. But there is a catch, as she orders him to make sure the banana tree grows in exactly five minutes, as she's busy thinking she needs the Prince Behemoth experience now. She then claims that Ara will never ever achieve her dreams, as she's never even been with a man before, so how can she handle the harrowing experience? Nevertheless, Ara discovers from Mira that almost everyone actually expects Ara to become the next queen, since it's pretty obvious from how she's the strongest on the planet. But Mira wants to know her plan on how she's going to install Herring as the next king of the wolves, since the current king is an absolute menace to both societies. We then learn that Books of Baram is so strong that he's been king for 15 whole years due to him easily dismantling his opponents. The only person that comes even close nowadays is Karim. But even the legendary swordsman took years until the king acknowledged him. As such, Mira comes to the conclusion that she's deluded only because her heart started beating at the sight of such a behemoth of a prince. But our white vampire refuses to reply, keeping that stone cold face, as if she looks like she's hiding the fact she needs to go to the bathroom. Nonetheless, one of the elite crimson foxes interrupt the two, as she spots the Garimbi elite from afar. At the same time, the Garimbi elite are overjoyed at finally finding the sacred mushrooms needed for the mission. As Wong begins to collect some of the blue columbines, he starts lecturing Herring about the role of the most elite squad in the Wolves' nation. He also explains that these flowers have an intense fragrance that only the higher class are allowed to use, so it's in very high demand. Unfortunately, the flowers only grow in enemy territory, so the only way to procure them is to send the elite special forces in, as no normies can handle the job. As they run out of flowers to collect in the area, the two roommates look on as they find themselves looking at a historical gorge. The place is named Jurujam, an area typically looking like a place you encounter the Demon King or Demon Queen in anime, for the first time. Wong then tells the old tale of the Valley of Hell, where it's apparently connected to a fire giant's footprint. However, Wong reveals information about the fog encompassing the area, warning him to not expose himself too long or else risk losing his entire mind. So he reminds Herring to not wander endlessly or else he will never get to go back home to play Minecraft and Roblox ever again. Unfortunately, the entire squad has to venture deep into the valley, as the further you go, the better quality of columbines will be found. As such, Wong throws a mask over to Herring exactly what you will need when you enter the bathroom right after me. Anyways, the rest of the group catch up, where Maru excitedly yells that it's time for the group to get rich, as the reward for the mission is the highest ever. Pork Bun Lover jumps in the fray as well, threatening Herring that if he even slows them down, they'll just throw him to the pack of foxes behind them. He also finally opens his eyes, telling Herring to stop replying formally and to stop holding back. And so he drops all formalities as Herring yells how much he likes plump people like Eden, especially with his half-closed eyes all the time. He continues insulting him as he smiles, telling him to rub his belly more often, since bro is only like 18, but he's already rocking a dad bod just like my boy, Luka Doncic. Afterwards, after putting Eden in his place, he turns to the other two, asking if they also want him to let it rip, just like my Beyblades, but they instantly nope out. Nevertheless, the group continues on forward as they leave the captain Karim behind as he's too busy eating chicken from Jollibee. But Herring does not want to leave the captain on his own, but Maru tells him it's fine, since he's overpowered. Maru then tells him to not worry about him as he can handle himself, plus, if the group ever gets in trouble, he'll always show up, just like when he got captured. 
Suddenly, as if it's like a bad omen smoke, they realize they are getting flanked already, as the fog leaves them wide open. Wong then confirms the arrival, as he listens in closely, able to hear the sounds of furious women running straight towards Prince Behemoth. The trees behind them begin to topple, as if the girls heard there's a 50% off sale at Luluman, ready to seize and grab their target. Sussy Wong then enters his battle stance fully flustered, as he starts talking about how he missed seeing girls in person. Then, out of nowhere, Mira comes slashing through the bushes, as if she's watched some bleacher runs. As Herring blinks, Mira has already struck right at Wong, but he's able to stand his ground, while our boy yells in the background. Wong then attempts to compliment Mira, but unfortunately for him, Mira in into guise so that's some tough luck, buddy. Shortly after, Miss Alita Angel comes bursting through, moving faster than I can fart, swiftly cutting through the air. She then goes straight for Herring, but our author knows what he's doing with some of these angles, as if he's mastered the art of cake trigonometry. While still levitating from the ground, she combos straight into an uppercut, but Herring is able to dodge with ease. This confuses Alita, as she instead accidentally allowed Herring to have a free sample of her armpit scent, since his dodges are literally accurate to the millimeter. But the girls don't stop there as more and more from the elite squad begin to flood in, although they start to complement his battle prowess from every single dodge. Herring is even able to dodge a combo attack from two simultaneous directions, but he's still unable to draw his sword due to pressure from every single direction. With no ability to counterattack yet, he finds himself with his back turned to a cliff, as his situation has started to become a little bit sticky. But then, out of the corner of his eye, he spots the girl that every man wants, the one and only blue-haired Kristen Stewart. The girls then stop attacking as someone yells out for the noob to grab this sword and use it to protect his face. Arrows then begin to pelt him from afar, but he's able to successfully deflect and stop them with his sword, thanks to the person warning him. The black serang then appears from atop the trees, yelling at Herring that more rounds are coming, but this time, they are aiming at his leg. However, he's unable to react in time as one of the arrows actually penetrate through his non-existent armor. After smelling my fart, he accidentally falls backwards down a cliff, as he has trouble balancing himself with an injured leg. Herring then closes his eyes as he falls as his life begins to flash before him, wishing he at least had another rice cake smashing before his demise. But then, a speedy Gonzalez appears as a flash of lightning begins to ping-pong left and right down the hill. It turns out to be the Black Serang again as he's now basically tasked to be the babysitter of our golden boy. To save Herring, he had to leave behind the boys battling for their lives as Karim orders him to go after Herring. Although initially stopped in his tracks by a Ra, Karim steps in to duel her, allowing the Black Serang the chance to save Herring. Karim then instantly demands Era to explain why he chose a dweeb over his Sigma male status, since he's still unable to get over it. So she mentions that she's going to become queen, not exactly explaining her reasons why, until she asks about what he wants in the future. Karim then claims that he also wants to be king, but she retorts that if he indeed became king, he'll be exactly like the rest of his predecessors, unlike Herring. As such, the simp overlord erupts in anger due to another rejection, yelling at her that he actually only wanted to siege her rice cake, since she's useless anyways. But Ura is not even slightly affected by his words, as she knows he's way too weak to handle her. Eventually, Karim charges forward, aiming straight for Ura's twin dragons, totally engulfed in jealousy and madness. And so the two begin to battle, as Ura is able to easily match all his attacks, as if she's just toying with the strongest male swordsman. Meanwhile, we discover that Herring has somehow survived the fall, even though the Black Serang is nowhere to be found. As he attempts to nurture his legs, some kind of entity appears beyond the fog as if it's some kind of monster. Herring finds himself surprised as he realizes that the entity is coming straight at him. As the entity closes the distance between the two, Herring freaks out as he's never seen something look like this in his entire life. Herring then remembers the rumors of Beneath the Depths, where people claim that an evil spirit exists at the bottom, ready to devour his soul and body. Out of nowhere, Herring hears a sound, telling him to stop looking at him like some kind of evil spirit, so he tries to wipe his eyes. 